I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Anglican tradition holds together strands from both the ancient one holy Catholic and apostolic church, as we affirm in the creed, along with some of the best insights from the Protestant Reformation. But even though that's an easy thing to say, as indeed we print something quite similar on the back of the bulletin every year, uh, it's something that can't be achieved always easily or without compromise. One area where we see that kind of compromise in our tradition is in our understanding of the sacrament. Uh, particularly, simple question, how many are there? Uh, most traditions can answer this in an, an unambiguous fashion. Catholic and Orthodox traditions would say seven. And many Protestant traditions say fewer than seven. Perhaps uh, two is a common number. And although Protestant traditions vary greatly in their theology, one from the next, uh, one thing that unites most Protestants is the view that for formulating doctrine of the church, the teaching of the church, Holy Scripture uh, is sufficient. And you see, Holy Scripture doesn't point as clearly to the other five factors, uh, namely unction, the healing with holy oil, confession to a priest privately in absolution, ordination to holy orders, marriage, and confirmation. Uh, there are pieces of them in this scripture, hints to be certain. Uh, in our book of Acts today, in the Acts reading, we saw something like an early rite of confirmation. Uh, we had this a great conversion of the Samaritans, and they had already been baptized. But after their baptism, the apostles, something like you know, the first bishops of the church, came to lay their hands on them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And similarly with unction, with the anointing with oil and healing, we know the apostles were sent out to cast out demons, heal the sick, and to anoint with oil. And so too for ordination, we see uh, at the bringing of the seven together to become the seven deacons in the book of Acts, the apostles lay their hands on them and pray for them something like an early rite of ordination. But nevertheless, the full understanding of these rites developed over time. They're not there in their fullness in the earliest days of the church. Uh, the way that we understand them, the sacramental rites in the church, they're part of the tradition of the church, not fully derived from Scripture directly as opposed to baptism and the Holy Eucharist, where we see Jesus participating in these himself, and he commands his disciples to do the same. And it's that direct biblical authority from Christ himself that gives Protestants confidence about those two. Maybe a little skepticism about church tradition uh, regarding the others. But for us Anglicans, in our usual way of holding both together, we would say that there's not two sacraments, but also not seven, but we come up with a kind of formula, two plus five. But what does that exactly mean? It's complicated as we always complicate things in our tradition, but if you do have a prayer book in front of you in the pew, go ahead and open it up to page 858. 858. And this is coming out of our catechism section. It's a, it's a small catechism, but it's basically a set of questions and answers about what the Christian faith is from our Anglican tradition. If you see that second question from the top on 858, there's a question. What are the two great sacraments of the gospel? The answer, the two great sacraments given by Christ to his church, are holy baptism and the Holy Eucharist. So baptism and the Eucharist are two in the two plus five formula. They're the most important sacraments of, of the church, uh, not only because they are given by Christ, not only because we clearly see them in the gospel, but a couple questions down, the, the catechism even explains that it's because these two sacraments are for everyone. 
all people are called to participate in baptism and receiving the body and blood of our Lord in the Eucharist. The others all have the power of the Holy Spirit behind them and are upheld by venerable church tradition. We see the antecedents of these rites in the scriptures, but they're not necessarily something that each and every person is called to participate in. For example, many of you are married, a sacramental a marriage, holy matrimony. I'm not. Um, I am ordained as a deacon and as a priest. And many of you uh, may never go through those rites. Some of us, many of us perhaps, will be anointed with uh, unction, healing oil in a time of illness. But uh, some of us uh, will not be, uh, either because the parish doesn't practice that tradition as much, or God forbid we die suddenly and unprepared and aren't able to be anointed in such a way. But not everybody will participate in the other five, necessarily. But the two have primacy for those reasons. Everyone is called to participate in them, and Christ directly sets the example with those two. So they're given an elevated status. So we say, well, there are seven, but yet there are these different statuses between the two, and that's how we hold the tradition together. Now, given that we've taken such pains in the tradition to really emphasize baptism and the Eucharist, and given that our rationale for doing so is that because Christ has participated in them, Christ gives these to us, we would think, okay, well, we, we must have a really strong understanding of Christ's participation in these sacraments, given that that's the reason why as Anglicans we elevate them over the others. And yet, for many of us, if uh, you know, if someday our Sunday school is back in session and a little Sunday school child says, well, uh, you know, Senior Warden, I was Jesus baptized. Uh-oh. You know, that can be a stumbling block. Uh, sometimes we're not ready to answer that because we get two things on the surface that just don't go together. You know, every week in the creed we say we believe in one baptism for what? For the forgiveness of sins. And we know that Jesus was like us in all ways apart from sin, that he was sinless. Um, the Roman Catholic tradition even takes the sinlessness a step further with the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, not to elevate Mary so much, although they do, but because to say that Mary was specially protected from sin so that even in the womb, Christ was that far from sin. But whether or not one accepts that particular doctrine, all Christians accept that Christ nevertheless led a totally sinless life. And so why one baptism for the forgiveness of sins for one who is perfectly sinless? This doesn't make sense. Now, I'll say at the outset here, we do not know the mind of Christ. In fact, if you read the Gospels, something you'll notice is that they tell us about what Jesus did, what he taught, the signs and wonders that he worked, but they don't tell us what he thought, because how could they? They never said, well, he intended this, that, or the other. It's just what he taught and what he did. But nevertheless, we have some reasonable conjecture as to why he participated in this rite with John the Baptist. First, and perhaps most simply, from the beginning, John was called to prepare the way of the Lord, to make the way for Jesus' ministry. And perhaps, now that the crowds were starting to hear John's message, the Holy Spirit was speaking through him, it was resonating in the hearts of the people, they were turning from their old ways and making way for what God was about to do through Jesus. They were being prepared. And Jesus noticed that John's ministry was taking off. And that could very well have been a sign to him that after all these years, now he's in his 30s, it is time for his ministry to begin. So he seeks out John the Baptist, the sign that the time has come. More deeply, though, we know that there is some work that is unique to Jesus, the Son of God, that is not given to us to do. Most centrally, the offering of himself on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of the whole world, to reconcile humanity to God. 
This was his work alone. His atoning sacrifice was not for the salvation of his own soul, but for the salvation of the world. And likewise, Christ's baptism is vicarious in this sense. It's not for forgiveness of his sin. He had none. But rather, he participates in baptism to draw others to baptism and by his participation in it, he adds a new dimension to baptism. John was pre preparation for Christ, forgiveness of sin only. But as Christ participates in baptism, and then in his resurrected form commands all to be baptized, it is a baptism that is beyond John's baptism. Um, yes, we are baptized for the forgiveness of sins, but not only that. Christian baptism, and it is Christian partly because Christ Christ participated in it and made it more than what it was for John. It is much more than remission of sin. In fact, our catechism covers this as well. In the section on baptism, check this later yourselves, but it asks, what is the inward and spiritual grace of baptism? All the sacraments, they have outward signs. The outward sign being the water, the words that are said. But what goes on in the person's soul? baptism. The prayer book says that the inward and spiritual grace of baptism is union with Christ in his death and resurrection, birth into God's family, the church, forgiveness of sins, yes, and new life in the Holy Spirit. Christ was bringing all of these things into being through his interaction with them. Just like at the Last Supper, he not only participates in Holy Eucharist, he instantiates it. He brings it into being. And here he is bringing into being the Christian sacrament of holy baptism. In baptism, we are given power to become part of God's family, to be part of something that is bigger than ourselves. We are given the guidance of the Holy Spirit to participate in the mission of God in this little bit of time, in this little place of the world that we're given to live our lives. As baptized Christians, we participate in God, what God is doing here. In baptism, we're not just forgiven, we're given the gift in Christian language, in a word we don't always hear all the time. We are given illumination. What does that mean? In a Christian sense, illumination means being able to see the world with the eyes of Jesus, not only with the philosophy of the time or the goodwill of the average person, but as Christ saw it, to be able to see one another as made in the image of God. We are given that most fully sacramentally through baptism. So when we rise from the waters of baptism, we come out either dripping wet sometimes, or maybe just a little water on the forehead. But either way, anointed with the Holy Spirit and with fire, not merely with a debt removed, but with the fire of the Holy Spirit burning in our hearts, propelling us to go out into the world as new people, part of a new family, a new creation, seeing the world as Christ saw it, and bringing a piece of Jesus to a world so desperately in need. I've spoken to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.